All right, we are back for another midweek segment on the Big Orange Podcast. I'm Charlie Burris. That is Zach Reagan of uh, A to Z Sports. We just wanted to to hop on. Obviously, the national championship has happened. Let's be honest. There's not much to talk about there. There could have been. But uh, TCU just decided to knock it off the bus. Um, but there, since that game, there's been all these way too early top 25s. And then, of course, the final AP poll. And uh, we just want to hop on here, talk about that a little bit, about uh, what happened, a little sort of post-mortem now that the national championship is over. Uh, I guess I'll start with this. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, blah, 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 blah. That's stuff that I normally say on the long show, but I'll say it here. I just might might as well do it on both. Uh, so, Zach, I guess just quickly, your thoughts on that national championship game, if you have any. <laughs> That was, uh, I mean, I was looking for stuff to do by before halftime. I mean, we pretty much saw where that was going. What a what a shame. We had that great day of the semifinal games. Both of those games were terrific, better than I expected them to be. And TCU kind of made me believe. I thought Georgia would win. I think everybody pretty much thought Georgia would win outside of, you know, people, TCU fans. But I, I felt like at least TCU would give give them a game and make it competitive. I mean, after the way they beat Michigan and then Ohio State, giving Georgia a, a close game, and, and they should have won that game, really. It, it that, that was rough. TCU gave me some false hope. I, I, I didn't want to live in a world where Sonny Dykes was a national champion, but I think that TCU winning would have been good for college football as a whole. I think it would have helped create more parity. I mean, you see a true Cinderella kind of come through and, and win that national championship. It kind of, I don't know, it just breaks up the monotony of Georgia winning it or Alabama winning it or, or you know, whoever else, Clemson getting in there from, from time to time. I, I think it would have been good for recruiting for everyone. Like, I think that's, you kind of want college football. It's, it's never going to be the way it was in the 90s, 80s, early 2000s in the BCS era. I mean, this is just – it's a new era of college football. The sport's changed a lot, and it's kind of moving in a in a direction that's similar to college basketball, in my opinion, when it comes to rosters being so different year to year. So, you know, with the playoff expanding, I, I just think it, it would have helped usher in this kind of new era where more teams are in it and you get these fun – Cinderella type stories like TCU where a team makes a run in December and uh, TCU just couldn't, couldn't quite pull it off. But I'm sure we'll see more of those stories in the coming years with the expanded playoff. Hopefully. I, I saw an article this morning that said it was the least watched national championship game in the history of of like recorded history since that metric has been I, kept. I mean, I told you that I, I kept forgetting that it was coming on that later that night on Monday. Like, I mean, I'm aware the national championship game is happening, but it wasn't something I was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is happening tonight. You got to check this out. I just kind of, I don't know, I wasn't, wasn't that hyped about it at all. It was interesting after that game. Everybody does this every year because the SEC wins the national championship every year. But they do the whole, the SEC has won – X national championships in the last 20 years since the beginning of the BCS era, the SEC has won whatever. And I mean, it, this is the honest truth. I, I texted you and Austin this like college football is not a nationwide sport. It is not. It is a Southern sport that the rest of the nation sort of like just pokes its head into. <laughs> they, they don't like the closest that you get is some of those Midwestern, you know, Michigan, Ohio state, some of those, but I mean, you get out West, nobody cares. And, and the fact that they had that game in Los Angeles was stupid. Nobody in Los Angeles even knows what college football is. And uh, it, it just all, all of the great recruits come from here. I mean, you saw, I saw a breakdown of Georgia's team. 77 dudes on that roster came from the state of Georgia. And it's like all five stars. The talent coming out of the state of Georgia is absurd. And that can also be said, I mean, Florida is probably number two on the list. Texas, I, it's, th those three are sort of interchangeable in terms of the real prime states for talent and it just runs down from there and every state below that it's all Southern states, except for California in some instances. And you know, it just, everything runs through the South in terms of college football. And that's, it's exciting obviously to be an sec team and the league's just going to get even better with Texas and Oklahoma, but you do have to be honest about the nature of this sport. It is not <laughs> some like nationwide phenomenon. And I think that reflects, Nobody cares at Georgia about Georgia. This is not 
some super exciting. Oh man, like the NCAA tournament is just so great. You get Gonzaga and North Carolina in a national championship game. You get like it goes all over the place. It's so much more, so much more parity, so much more widespread, and so much more intrigue. I think the college football is just so much more popular in a general sense that it gets that top billing. But I mean, nobody outside of the South really cares. <laughs> that's uh, that's over generalizing, but. I, I, it just is the truth when you really look at the whole scope of everything. Yeah, I mean, it really is, and that that it that that is one reason why that game being in Los Angeles was so strange. I mean, it was a uh, what the game kicked off at like seven forty five Eastern, I think four forty five local time in LA. You're playing a national championship game like that's so. I know that that happens with the Super Bowl as well whenever they play it on the West Coast, but it's still just kind of a weird thing to me. Maybe that's just the East Coast bias in me talking, but. I, I mean, I get that they want to like move the game around because you do want some more national appeal. They, uh, the NCAA obviously probably doesn't love the SEC, you know, have the stronghold that it has on the sport. And it really proved this year that it still has that stronghold. I mean, Georgia winning the championship, Tennessee beating the ACC, cha ACC champion. Um, I think somebody else beat the uh, somebody or Kansas State. Were they the ones that won the? Uh, Big 12. They won the Big 12. They beat uh, yeah. easy Alabama, you know, handled them pretty easy. So, I mean, the SEC kind of showed its its dominance once again, and they're trying to, you know, stop that narrative and make it a more national sport. So you put the championship game in L.A. But, yeah, I think that game would have had a little more juice if it would have been in, like, New Orleans or, or maybe even Dallas, somewhere a little more neutral than the West Coast, L.A., where they really don't care about college football, where UCLA's – I mean, UCLA could go 10-2, and two, and it's not really moving the needle in that city, uh, not behind pro sports and, you know, the Lakers, the Clippers, the MLB teams and all that stuff. It's just not It's not happening. Well, it, it, did, it did make me think, seeing that layout of Georgia's roster and where they come from, Tennessee has to dip into Georgia more to take them off of that pedestal. And, and that's true of everybody. Alabama, too. South, I mean, I don't know if South Carolina can, but Florida, Florida State, you got to start getting into Georgia or else. I mean, that just it's just a factory of great players. And now that they got that going, <laughs> I, I'm not sure how you stop that train outside of them, maybe having a really terrible quarterback in some years or something like that. It, uh, it's just going to end up being, the, you know, what it is. But I don't, I don't want to dwell on that too long. The real point of this was to lead into the final AP poll. Obviously, Georgia is number one. They put TCU at number two, but a lot of people were saying that the a lot of people voted before that game even happened, and it's like tradition to keep those team one and two the same. I mean, obviously, that's dumb. TCU in no way was the second best team in college football this year. Uh, they lost by sixty in the national championship game, but uh, Tennessee comes in at number six, behind Alabama, of course. Uh, we all know the, the media hates Tennessee, and we all know that Tennessee has a better resume than Alabama. Tennessee finished the season with a better win than Alabama finished the season with. And, of course, they beat Alabama. Uh, that's stupid, but are we not just resigned to this at this point? It's what happened all through the, the latter half of the season. Yeah, I mean, I kind of assumed that this was what's going to happen. I mean, I put out that I thought Tennessee should have been fourth, and – at the time, I had them above Ohio State and Alabama. I, I can kind of see the argument for Ohio State staying at fourth with the way they lost to Georgia, like it's a game that they should have won if, if Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't get hurt. If they hit that field goal, you know, they're playing TCU. Maybe we get a better championship game. So I, I can see that argument. But TCU, I mean, they there's an argument for them to fall to, you know, sixth or seventh. Yeah, uh, you lose that bad. I mean, look how far Tennessee lost or fell after they lost South Carolina. Obviously, South Carolina is not Georgia, but still losing by 25 and then losing by almost 60. You, you know, that's pretty significant. Tennessee lost to that same team by 14 points. And if they complete a pass there at the very end of the game, they only lose by seven. A loss is a loss, but obviously much different games. Tennessee, despite some of the national narrative that that game was a blowout, it, you know, it really wasn't. Um, if this was a regular season game, TCU would have fell seven, eight spots in the polls. Yes. So that, yeah, that's one aspect of this. And then obviously the Alabama aspect, like you mentioned, the only argument for Alabama is Tennessee's loss to South Carolina, which 
I, I mean, obviously losses and how you lose and, and all that comes into play, and it has to be a factor. But I think your wins should be weighted more than your losses. Like, I've always just kind of assumed that's what's looked at first. And then you go to the losses, you know, maybe uh, if, if you need a tiebreaker. But in, in this instance, the tiebreaker is beating Alabama. I mean, you're both you both have the same record. Tennessee beats Alabama head to head. They they beat LSU by twenty seven points head to head. LSU beat Alabama. It's just black and white. Like it's right there. There's no real justification for them to be over uh, Tennessee. And then on top of that, Tennessee also beat Clemson, like you mentioned. Uh, I know Alabama beat Kansas State, but then Pittsburgh finished ranked in the top twenty five. So that gives Tennessee four top twenty five wins, three top. 16 wins wherever LSU was. I think they were like 16th. Alabama's got the win over Kansas State. They have a win over what number 19 or 20 Mississippi State and then Texas who snuck in there. I think that's their only ranked win. So Tennessee's wins obviously much better than Alabama's. I don't I, I don't see how they can justify it. There's just no changing these people's minds. They they're at this point with how good Alabama is, has been for so long. I mean, you just can't get them off of that delusion that, you know, Alabama, well, it's Alabama. That's, that's what the, that's the rationalization. Well, it's Alabama. Well, okay. This is Tennessee, a far superior state in my personal opinion. So, you know, whatever, uh, you know, I think I would probably go probably Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, Tennessee, Alabama, I think. And then TCU probably drop a minute. What what would that make them? Sixth? Yeah. Oh, I might, yeah. might even drop them further than that. That Michigan win's impressive, though. The Michigan, you, you went over number two and then a 60-point loss to number one. It's a little hard to reconcile, but... Yeah, but, I, think if, I think if TCU plays Georgia in the regular season or even the semifinal, if Sonny Dykes doesn't run his mouth about the SEC and their scheduling, which was a, such a stupid comment to make. Like, I don't... <laughs> I don't like it when Alabama plays a FCS team or a group of five team the week before Auburn. I hate it. I mean, I know they do that on purpose, kind of as like almost like a built-in bye. I mean, it's not a bye week. You still work and practice and do all that stuff. But it, it's not going to be a physical game leading into Auburn. I mean, I understand why they do it, but they're still playing the – they're still playing an SEC schedule. They're still playing their same, you know, out-of-conference games. They play Texas. Tennessee played Pittsburgh. I mean, I, it, it was an asinine comment. And we've seen Kirby really over the last couple of months. He thrives off motivating his team. I mean, to the point where he is just making stuff up out of thin air. I mean, there's a player that said that, a Georgia player that said there were some media members saying Georgia would go 7-5 and five this year. And I cannot remember a single person saying Which that. one was that? <laughs> The only thing that anybody ever said about Georgia was, I don't know if they'll be have that same dominant defense because they lost a lot of talent to the draft and they still have a lot to prove with these younger players stepping up. But I think everybody kind of threw in the caveat that they're still five-star players, so they're probably going to be pretty good again. Like, I don't remember ever seriously doubting Georgia. In fact, when they were ranked number three behind Tennessee, when Tennessee was number one, I, I guess Ohio State was number two at the time. I was kind of surprised that they dropped Georgia down that far. And I think we should have talked more about it at the time, What, how disastrous that was for Tennessee to be number one before that Georgia game because you know that's all that was talked about in that locker room in Athens for a whole week was them doubting Georgia and putting them at number three. So I think all of that motivation like just came out in that national championship game. And Kirby made it a point to like run the score up he wanted to demolish TCU and embarrass them. And, and it wasn't just because of Sonny Dyke's comments. It was because he convinced himself and his team that they were slighted all year long. And they were trying to go out there and make a statement. And they did. And that extra motivation yeah. helped. Like people can, people can laugh at locker room and bulletin board material and all this stuff. But I think it does matter. I think it matters a lot. And I think Kirby proved that this week. He, he got the opportunity to steamroll a far inferior team and he just took it and and ran with it. I mean, yeah, he's a psycho behind close. Are you obviously you can tell he's a Nick Saban acolyte. 
because that's Saban. That was his signature move when they were just so good year in and year out. He all you have to just make stuff up because I I, I said and this to somebody yesterday when when nobody disrespects you, you just have to disrespect yourself. <laughs> that's, it's, the Michael, it's the Michael Jordan approach. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I took uh, look, that personally. Bad news for the SEC West. Alabama's got a really good class coming in. I don't know Ugh. who their quarterback is going to be. But David Pollock, former Georgia player, just – I mean, he gave Nick Saban all the material he needs for 2023 when he sat up there and talked about Georgia's, you know, kind of the king of college football now or whatever his exact words were, right to Nick Saban's face, literally looking at Saban while he said it. And Saban just kind of put his head down. And it was like, yeah, I'm going to remember that. That's going to be played a lot. Back pocket. <laughs> And it will be like they won't talk about it publicly. They're smarter than that. Kirby's very measured with his public comments. He never he doesn't really disrespect the other team in public. Obviously, we got a little sneak peek into what he says behind closed doors with the audio floating around of his pregame speech. But I mean, that stuff is used behind closed doors. Nick Saban said it earlier this year. I think it was his coach's call-in show where he's told his players that they weren't taking it personal enough essentially and it, it almost felt like he was talking to henry toto at the time because it was right after that tennessee game when when he kind of talked about that and those uh comments that toto made about it not being personal had been out there so prevalent but he's like you have to make it personal because the team you're playing is making it personal if you don't make it personal they have an edge I, so that's I really, the way he coaches i really do wonder and in no way would i blame him for this but i, I wonder if in older age saban I'm not going to say he's gone soft. I don't think Saban will ever go soft, but he just has had his edges rounded out where he, I like Kirby is just young Saban. He's just yelling at everybody, cursing at everybody, absolute tyrant, like that whole thing. Like his pregame speech sounded like a child throwing a temper tantrum. And and people were like, oh, isn't this so great? So great. I mean, I guess it I probably looked like that too if we would have seen it. <laughs> That's true. His, his, his little short guy up there just <laughs> yeah. Um, and and it's that it is just classic. That comes from Saban. That's the Saban tree. That's the Saban way. Um, and I think in older age, I mean, I wonder if he has just gone like, you know, I got grandkids, I got other stuff going on in my life, and I'm I'm just not gonna be this. <laughs> <laughs> this psycho that steamrolls everybody anymore. I obviously that's complete speculation on my part, but I just wonder if he he's kind of lost a little bit of that edge. I mean, you see it, it, it definitely happens. You're seeing it with John Calipari in basketball right now. Not that he was some crazy tyrant, but he's just lost the game's passing by. Like the that those things just eventually happen. Um, and so I yeah, I ugh, it's just gross. We got to do something. <laughs> something has to be done about Georgia. Um, and obviously, we're about to talk about the future and what, what might happen going forward in the next season. Uh, but, man, uh, got to start getting players out of Georgia. Got to just start doing anything and everything to build something that can go up against Georgia. Because if you I mean, if you don't give 100% effort to that, they are just going to sit up there and, and rule rule this game for a while. Then yeah, they got to. They got to become psychos on the rec on the, with recruiting when it comes to yeah. offensive and defensive linemen because you just watch Georgia's games and that's what stands out more than anything. I mean, Tennessee's got fast players now. They're they got the speed. They could use more speed, obviously, but we saw good speed from them this year. But just you look at Georgia's offensive line and they look like an NFL offensive line going up against a high school team out there. You know, whoever they're lined up against at times and. The same goes for their defensive line. And that was the difference in the Georgia-Tennessee game. You know, if Tennessee's offensive line, which played well all season long, I thought they gave a valiant effort against Georgia. They were just overmatched. If they hold up better against Georgia, I mean, that, that game comes down to the wire easily because, you know, nobody wants to really talk about it outside of Tennessee fans, but Tennessee had guys open that game. They had receivers wide open down the field. Hooker was off. Wasn't his best day. He missed some of those guys. Uh, he was had pressure in his face a lot of those throws. It wasn't really his fault, uh, but some of the throws were. I mean, that right there was the difference in the game. So if they want to beat Georgia, you've got to start getting five stars on the offensive line, defensive line, like not just one. It's like it sounds like a daunting task, but it has to be an offensive line full of five star guys if you want to win the has SEC East. That's the only way. Period. But with that that said, I mean, we can go on about all of that all day and the changes that are coming in college football, but. 
bunch of different outlets release their AP or AP release their way too early top 25s. I don't love this because obviously so many of these teams are going to have a different, including Tennessee are going to have a different outlook by the time the season actually comes. I think Tennessee will get even more transfer players. Who knows exactly how that quarterback battle goes, you know, things like that. And that's true of every school, but um, I mentioned it in the post game with Crompton after the orange bowl, what's about to happen for Tennessee is big time preseason hype. That's what you built yourself into now. And Joe Milton went out and gave a really nice performance against Clemson and beat Clemson by 17. And that's going to build a lot of equity and have a lot of people giving you preseason buzz. And turns out that was absolutely correct. Sporting news and Fox sports both had Tennessee at number five in the preseason. Fox sports put Tennessee ahead of Alabama <laughs> in their way too early top 25. Um, and then uh, 247 Sports, let me see. 247 has Tennessee at number 12. I'm not sure who put that together. And then ESPN has Tennessee at number 10 uh, for this coming season. So, you know, nothing below 12, as high as five. There's going to be a lot of hype this offseason, man. And that's a little daunting. Yeah, I, I like that ESPN one the best, like 10th, 9th, right yeah. around in there is where I think – it's where I think Tennessee legitimately should be because I think you start over. Tennessee has not earned the – as much as we talked about the Alabama bias, uh, I'm fine with them getting a little bit of uh, the benefit of the doubt with preseason polls because they, they have proved year after year that they're going to be a top five, top ten team. Tennessee has it. I mean, this is the first time Tennessee's been close to the top five at the end of the year in 20 years or over 20 years. So they got to kind of earn that respect a little bit. And I'm fine with that. Uh, I, I don't, you know, the last time Tennessee was preseason top five was 2005 and it was a disaster. They were ranked third going into the season. They finished five and six. That was the beginning of the end for Philip Fomer. I, I don't think this program's in a place yet where it can deal with that preseason hype. I think that was part of what happened at the end of the year is, uh, when they went to number one in the playoff after that Kentucky game, the, I mean, we've talked about this before, the mindset kind of flipped from everybody's shocked we're doing this to uh, we're the best team in the country and we're supposed to win these games. And and once that mindset flipped, it took Tennessee a minute to kind of get back on track. And they did. They did against Vanderbilt. They did against Clemson. So, I mean, I'm not worried about the mindset of the program, but it's tough to learn to manage these expectations and to handle them. And if they get crowned, you know, People start picking them to beat Georgia in the SEC East, which I don't think is going to happen after what Georgia did to TCU. But that could be tough to manage. Like you said, it could be daunting. So I'm okay with like ninth or 10th. I think they're deserving of that. Gives them room to move up. Gives them, you know, not over, you know, insane hype where it's just like, oh, my God. Ten yeah, I'm sure there will be people that pick Tennessee to win. Uh, to make the playoff and win the national championship is like a dark horse pick or just, they're just kind of off the wall pick because they want to be different. Like those predictions will be out there, but it's not going to be, oh, Tennessee's the front runner for the national championship. And then they got to manage that all season and live up to that. I'm, I'm glad that's not going to be the situation. I definitely like that these predictions leave Tennessee room to grow. There's nothing crazy. Like you said, def national championship, we're going to expect them to win the SECs. I don't think there's going to be much of that. You, you just play in the league with the best team in college football. Unfortunately, isn't that how it always works out for Tennessee, it seems. Um, but it it is uh, still just incredible to reflect on how you got here after this season. I've said it all year since, I would say since the Alabama game, maybe even the LSU game. Like, how long has it been now? 20 no what 24 months i think hypo got hired in january mm -hmm. of 2020 right so 20, 2021 two yeah just two years yeah 2021 sorry two years and this guy has tennessee finishing an 11 and 2 season and then as a preseason top 10 team accord as of now you know barring serious injuries or anything like that god forbid transfers uh <laughs> It's just so crazy, dude. I, I I just can't say enough. Yeah, it would be daunting to get those major predictions to be, you know, a, a very serious contender. But at the same time, I I'm just so appreciative. Like to think 
that this team would be finishing an 11 and two season with top 10 aspirations. The next season is just off the charts. Who, who thought that this was going to happen? I mean, I remember us having the conversations like, you know, I'm not sure Josh Heupel will be the guy to take Tennessee to national championship aspirations, but he could, he could be the guy that gets us back to 10 wins a year ish, nine, 10, 10 a year. And then you find, you find the guy. Um, and turns out he may, he may be that guy. He he himself may be the guy uh, that we were talking about. And oh, it's just so crazy. I didn't think that this stuff would ever happen to Tennessee. I, <laughs> I even had a conversation last night. During, one of my best friends in the world is a Vandy fan. And obviously Tennessee played Vandy in basketball last night. Beat him by like 10. Um, and and I was, you know, it, Tennessee was down at the half. And I texted my friend and I was like, you know, I do think we'll win, but that you know Tennessee knows no limit on the pain they will cause you and he was like honestly it makes me mad that you're saying that because of like what has happened in the last two years and you think about it basketball great baseball great football great like <laughs> it's all th there's no more everybody who's been the put your cup on and all of that stuff I don't I don't know I mean do we when do you like maybe you don't ever grow out of that you just stay damaged just because that's what happened back then but i mean i don't think that we are in a place any longer where we can be like oh we're just it's gonna crash and burn i can feel it coming i don't as crazy as i can't believe i'm saying that i really can't but i i think we may be there yeah pretty much i guess we are there right i mean every you know what Basketball is number five. Football is number six. Baseball was what number two, two. or three, two. Yeah. And there's still people out there that throw shade at Tennessee and and try to like talk about Tennessee like they're not a factor. Like, oh, this is your first time experiencing success and all this stuff because they see everything on social media. And it's like, no, you're just now paying attention. Tennessee fans never. It's like they're coming out of a cave where they've been for the past 15 years. They've been there passionately rooting for the program through every tough loss, through every tough coaching change. Uh, nobody really deserves to, to go through this more than Tennessee fans to see this success, to see Josh Heupel unexpectedly lead the team to 11 wins two years after people were saying it would be years before Tennessee even got back to a bowl game. I mean, th those tapes were out there. Uh, Tennessee will never be elite again. Uh, the Sporting News, guy from the Sporting News wrote that, Matt Hayes. All that stuff was, you know, put out there two years ago. And Tennessee fans were like, you know what? There's really nothing. You're probably right. Like, there's no, there's nothing we can point to to say that you're wrong because it, this is rock bottom. The program's a disaster. There's three and seven. Everybody's leaving. Nobody knows who this coach is hardly that we've hired. Like, it's it's a guy from uh, that, that won at Oklahoma 20 some years ago. Good for him. Uh, he's won at UCF, taking over for Scott Frost. Is he really that good? I mean, we all had those conversations and just like it always in, in coaching and in sports, some of the best hires you make are the ones that don't really get that much attention. In fact, it's probably most of the time. Those are the hires that do work out. They kind of come out of nowhere. The ones with all the hype, like Chip Kelly at UCLA took a little while to get going. Jim Harbaugh at Michigan took a while to get going. I think we know now John Gruden would have been a disaster anywhere he went. And that's who Tennessee fans at one time or two different times wanted more than anybody. So sometimes it's the hire that you make that you, you know, comes out of nowhere that ends up being the best one. And and I think that was the case with Josh Heupel. And, you know, if Philip Fomer stepping down through that Jeremy Pruitt stuff is what made this happen, because I don't think there's any way Philip Fomer hires Josh Heupel. No. And, you know, if Philip Fulmer doesn't step down, Danny White's not hired. And Danny White is probably the only person that does hire Josh Heupel. And honestly, if you're Josh Heupel at UCF, if it's not Danny White, what would have been attractive about coming to Tennessee at that time? You know, he was doing his 28 and 8 there in three years. Uh, he would have, he could have kept Tom in the coaching ladder. Obviously, we know now that he can coach. Like, he would have continued to have success there. More success, I think. Um, he could have waited for another job. So, uh, you know, one, little decisions uh, like like Fomer stepping down, like going and getting Danny White is all led to where Tennessee's at now. And it was a series of really bad decisions that got Tennessee in a mess. 
And finally, that series of decisions were like the right decisions. And it's got Tennessee back to 11 and two. It was pretty vindicating. I don't know exactly where I saw it. I don't remember, but it was a national writer that said Josh Heupel proved this season that his system works in big time college football. There's something to that effect um, from a national writer with no ties to Tennessee. And I was like, that's it right there. That's how you know that this whole thing is real because you have these guys that have disrespected Tennessee for so long now, actually even like they're even admitting, okay, this guy, this works. This, this is real. This is the real deal. He's shown you can win big games and big spots against great teams with what he's doing. Uh, and I, <laughs> again, I just can't believe that that is actually happening at the University of Tennessee because just how would the right word be like, everybody says like red pill and blue pill. I think I was like black pilled on Tennessee. Like I was just, this administration is the most incompetent, ridiculous joke in all of college sports. You know, throw them in the dumpster. This uh, in, until that, until their wholesale changes there, this will never ever come back and then there were and look i don't there weren't whole wholesale changes it was a couple of spots that you just had to find the right person it was obviously the ad it was the president it was the chancellor and all of that working together i mean ultimately the board of trustees doesn't factor as huge into that as the people that handle the day-to-day -day like those three do and you change that out to the right people finally and look what happens i think you're exactly right fulmer going out because he would have tried to go out and make another sort of antiquated hire like pruitt or something like that and uh and that wouldn't have worked and danny white comes in with all these innovative ideas he's an incredible marketer he's an incredible fundraiser he does everything that we know he does now and and just brings in a guy that's working on the cutting edge of college football pushing every single boundary and look what it gets you here we are you know and top uh, a top 10 finish with uh, preseason top 10 predictions for the following year. So what a time to be alive as a Tennessee fan uh, with a top five basketball team and a top five baseball team. If, if women's basketball could just get back, uh, they've been playing better lately. I, I will say, uh, I think they're still undefeated in the sec, but um, man, it, it, well, it just really is crazy the way that the fortunes have, <laughs> have turned for Tennessee, man. And you know what, like what really makes me believe that this is truly sustainable for Tennessee, because it look, it could be a one year wonder type situation. I'm sure there's a lot of people on the outside kind of watching out for that. Like, OK, good season, Tennessee. Now do it again and do it again and do it again. Uh, they have to. And I think TCU is going to deal with a lot of that, too. Uh, and, and I've been somebody that said to you outside of this show, like, I wouldn't be surprised if Sonny Dice is a one-year wonder at TCU because he has been a 500-type coach his entire career. And I'm sure TCU fans would look at me and be like, what are you talking about? No, you didn't watch this program the way we did and see the changes that they made. And maybe they're right. I, you know, I don't know. But I can see people saying that same thing about Josh Heupel. The one reason that I don't think that will be the case is the way they responded in that South Carolina game and the Georgia game, too. You lose Georgia, you kind of you get knocked off the top of the world, the hype dies down, you're not undefeated anymore, and you come back out, you struggle a little bit at the start of the Missouri game, but then you pick up where you left off and you beat them by 40 some points. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is this is that same team. They had to get off the mat a little bit, but they recovered. And then the South Carolina game happens where, yeah, they were looking past them. They thought the game was going to be easy. Maybe even the coaches thought that to some extent. Guys didn't play hard. You had the weird Jeremy Bates situation. It, it was just a South Carolina, you know, broke out like a new offense in the middle of the season. It was just a bad night. Really, really one of the worst losses in, in recent Tennessee history. I mean, it's right up there with the 2016 South Carolina loss because it, it knocked you out of the playoff, essentially. And that 2016 loss, you know, knocked you out of the SEC East uh, of winning it. So then they come back and they respond – really well against Vanderbilt on the road. A Vanderbilt team that was playing pretty well, that wanted bowl eligibility, that that really wanted to win that game, and they just never gave them a chance. I mean, 56 to nothing in the rain. Then you got this long layoff. 
you've got players opting out. You've got guys leaving, a few guys, not a lot, but key guys. And you go beat Clemson, a top 10 team that, you know, they they, they had two guys out, uh, two important guys, but that's still a really good team. And you beat them by 17 points. The way they responded in those games without some of their best players, after it would have been, you know, they, they miss out on the playoff, it would have been easy to kind of have a, a – playoff hangover there where you're disappointed you didn't get in i mean they played great the defense played great they were they they cared about the way they were perceived and they wanted to erase that perception and they gave up 14 points in eight quarters after giving up 65 in columbia just the way the entire team responded makes me feel like okay hypos this wasn't lightning in a bottle like this is what the, this is the program hypos building and this is what they're going to be and it's not going to be perfect and there will be hiccups from time to time i'm sure i'm sure they might lose another inexplicable game we saw Dabo lose a lot of those games as he was coming up i mean they, they it was a verb <laughs> daboing i mean they're clemsoning that was like the thing for so many years until they finally got over the top over the hump so they'll probably have some of those moments but i, I truly believe that this team is not far from having like a nine to ten win floor, where that is the worst that they're going to be under Hypo. I certainly hope so. Obviously, we'll just have to see, and the expectations are certainly there for next season. Uh, already a top ten predicted team, so plenty to live up to for Hypo. Uh, I guess, well, I guess we can finish with this. I can make this a separate video on its own. So go, I'll post what we're doing currently on Wednesday, and then I'll post this next portion on uh, Thursday. And let's just talk about the Kentucky-Tennessee basketball game quickly because I want to I want to talk about Kentucky basketball <laughs> uh, too. So go go watch that. If you're watching this on Wednesday, or if you're watching this on Thursday, I mean, that Kentucky video should already be up. Uh, and if you're watching it on Wednesday, subscribe and then watch that Kentucky video on Thursday. Uh, Charlie Burr, Zachary, I can see you then.